Throughout the history of humanity, at the most unexpected moments, a mysterious black monolith appears. The encounter with which is accompanied by changes in the history and development of humanity. A tribe of pithecanthropes learns new skills, millions of years later astronauts find the meaning of existence, and the crew of a spaceship heading for Jupiter suddenly realizes why aliens are watching Earth closely. Planet Earth, prehistoric Africa. Life there goes on as usual, animals hunt for food, and a tribe of pithecanthropes periodically drives away from its source a rival tribe which also claims ownership of the area, but so far in all conflicts the masters are victorious. One morning, a member of the tribe discovers the appearance of a strange black stone in front of the cave. The tribe examines it from all sides, but still does not understand what it is or where it came from. Nevertheless, the monolith seems to attract them, and the pithecanthropes constantly sit near it, and one day, going hunting, one of the aborigines for the first time takes the bone in his hands and uses it as a tool. Tom later, a neighboring tribe again tries to take away the desired piece of land, but the owners are now armed with bones and sticks, with the help of which they not only drive away the invaders, but also kill some of them. Millions of years pass, humanity has long since mastered space, building ships and space stations with advanced technology, and now space travel has become an everyday thing. One day, Dr. Haywood Floyd, chairman of the U.S. National Council of Astronautics, goes to the U.S. lunar base Clavius. He arrives at an intermediate station where he is met by Mr. Miller, the scientist's escort. He escorts Floyd to the terminal, who asks the doctor to introduce himself in full form, giving all the data about himself, including the country of residence. Floyd complies and is given full access to the station's services. His ship leaves in an hour, so he has time to eat. But first the man wants to call someone and goes to the call room. The call is answered by his daughter, who is celebrating her birthday today. She asks for a doll as a present, and the father promises to fulfill her wish and asks her to say hi to her mom. A little later, the man meets some scientists who, having learned that he is flying to Clavius, ask him to share with them the strange things that are going on there. The doctor doesn't know what they're talking about, but they tell him that the station's answering machine tells him that the line is temporarily unavailable. It happens in space but not for 10 days, so it doesn't look like an equipment malfunction. Moreover, two days ago, one ship was denied an emergency landing on Clavius, and this is a violation of space convention, which is punished quite strictly. So it is clear that because of the nonsense on such a violation no one will not go. From reliable sources the scientists learn that an epidemic has broken out on the station, but Floyd can't discuss it. At this point he says goodbye to his colleagues who wish him luck and ask him to report the problem if possible. Floyd flies to the base. During the flight the stewardesses deliver healthy food in special boxes. Finally, his flight ends with his arrival on Clavius. The pilots land the ship at the equipped spaceport where they are already welcomed. The dome of the underground receiving area opens, and the ship descends into the spaceport. Later, Floyd addresses a staff meeting where he emphasizes the need to keep their newest discovery a secret. He understands their displeasure at the rumors of the epidemic, for it could have disturbed their friends and loved ones on Earth. He himself also finds the legend unconvincing, but he fully agrees with the assertion that the discovery must remain secret, for its public disclosure could cause a tremendous culture shock, and he has flown in to gather facts and opinions, as well as to prepare a report for the World Council. Later, Dr. Floyd is taken to the site where the artifact was recently found. On the way, his colleagues tell him that it all started with the discovery of a strange monolith, which was first mistaken for a fragment of magnetic rock, but nothing can create a field of such power, then people decided that it was a part of some building and started excavations, but again they found nothing, what's more, it turns out that this object is immune to erosion. It seems to have been deliberately hidden four million years ago. Upon reaching the site, the scientists examine the find surrounded by a bunker, after which the group decides to take a photo against the background of the artifact. But then the moon dawns, and the black monolith catches the sunlight for the first time after millions of years of imprisonment, after which a piercing electronic sound is heard in the helmets of the people standing around which flies somewhere towards Jupiter. Eighteen months later, the US spacecraft Discovery 1 is headed for Jupiter, and it is the first trip in that direction. The beginning of the flight is going smoothly. Two crew members perform daily pilot duties. On TV comes news of a recorded communication conversation with the ship. A journalist tells that the crew consists of five people and a computer with artificial intelligence. Three of the crew spend the journey in a hibernation state. 
the viewers are introduced to the ship's commander Dr. Bowman and his assistant Dr. Poole, who say that the flight is in normal mode. But the thing is that for the first time the crew was in cryosleep before the start. It turns out that it was done in order to save supplies because in hibernation a person takes only one breath per minute. Then the presenter introduces the audience to the artificial intelligence hall, and he answers all the questions, saying that he is the most reliable in the world and can't make mistakes. He likes working with people and even though he is constantly busy, he enjoys it. Dr. Poole confirms that they see Hal as the sixth member of the crew. Later Frank receives a birthday greeting from Earth. He is contacted by his parents, who tell him about their life and show him the cake they ordered for him. They are proud of their son and so are the parents of his co-workers. Later, the astronaut plays chess with Hall and loses. Time later, Hall asks Bowman to show his resunks and then tells him that they supposedly found an interesting find on the moon. He also says that their flight was prepared in strict secrecy, but then Hall stops the revelation because he discovered a malfunction in the antenna control device. In 72 hours it will be completely out of service. An astronaut in a capsule goes into outer space, removes the strange unit and brings it aboard the ship. They test its operation but find no malfunction. Hall suggests that they put the unit back in place and let it fail so they can figure out the problem. Mission Control approves of this decision, however, it points out that Hall has made a mistake, although it is simply unbelievable. Upon learning of this conclusion, Hall declares that a human is to blame. Concerned about the computer's behavior, Bowman and Poole enter the spacewalk capsule to talk privately. They decide to disable Hall if he is proven wrong. Unaware that Hall is watching their conversation by reading their lips, later Poole goes to change the antenna unit, and while he is out of the capsule, Hell seizes control of the capsule and sends the astronaut into outer space. Bowman sees this through a porthole, takes another capsule and goes outside to rescue his friend. He catches up with the body and grabs it with his manipulators, but realizes there is nothing he can do to help his dead friend. At this time, Hall disables the life support functions of the crew members who are in a state of anabiosis, killing them. When Bowman returns to the ship with Poole's body, Hell refuses to let him back in, stating that their plan to disable it jeopardizes the entire mission. The astronaut releases Poole's body and uses remote manipulators to open one of the ship's airlocks, but he does not have a spacesuit helmet. Nevertheless, the man manages to bring the capsule closer, so that the air coming out of it pushes him inside he succeeds and the astronaut gets into the ship. He goes to Hall's processor core and begins disabling its working circuits, ignoring the computer's pleas for forgiveness. And eventually Hall's mind dies. When it ends, a pre-recorded video by the manual is played, revealing that only Hall knows the actual purpose of the mission. It turns out that 18 months ago, a black monolith found beneath the surface of the moon sent a radio signal toward Jupiter, which is what the mission was supposed to test. Bowman continues the mission alone and orbits Jupiter, finding a third, much larger monolith orbiting the planet. He leaves Discovery in a capsule and enters an unusual color stream where he observes strange astronomical phenomena and space scenery. Suddenly he finds himself in a large bedroom. Finding himself in shock, the man explores the room and sees a more mature version of himself. The elderly Bowman also seems to sense someone's presence and even goes to the door, but finds no one. But suddenly he hears heavy breathing and sees an old man dying in bed. In turn, the old man also feels someone's presence but sees no one. Then a black monolith appears in front of the bed. And when the old man reaches for it, it turns into an embryo encased in a transparent ball of light floating in space above the earth. Many people have speculated about what Stanley Kubrick was trying to say. Perhaps he sought to convey the idea that time is vast and inexorable, while human life passes only a moment for the universe. A person's birth, life and death occur in a short span of time, but in the process he or she passes on life to the next generations. Write in the comments what you think about it.